Oh, we got more in the back row today. That's good. <laughs> uh, any uh, concerns or questions that have come up in life about the homework, the superhero paper? It's getting closer. Uh, I realize we were getting through this unit. Um, we actually will have a test next week. It's on Friday, though. Well, we uh, started Chapter 10 on projectile motion last time. I intend to finish it today. Then we get to do the special theory of relativity in Chapter 35 for two lectures. Then we'll review and have an exam before I give you much more material. So, but, so that one's on your radar. Again, this is all laid out in WebAssign in the calendar, so you know what, what's coming up when. And... I found some uh, good thick rubber bands, so I fixed this, sort of, <laughs> even though we moved on. I still, I wanted to shoot it faster. Remember the bands broke? So we can pull it back. And you know how, um, well, you know all about inertia now. Things at rest want to stay at rest, and things in motion want to stay in motion. So if you get something flying, it's in motion. It wants to stay in motion unless what happens? Yeah, other forces act on it. What in real life, in our experience with the natural world, what can those forces be that try to mess with it in flight? Gravity. Gravity. Air resistance. Air resistance. Hitting something else. Good. Yeah, so in, in real life, there, there are forces acting on it. So we see it eventually stop, curve down or slow down. Well... We can add a little more inertia to it to help it keep going. It's something we didn't cover in here, but it's still inertia. It's a rotational inertia. What's something, you already know this, what's something when you throw it, if you spin it, it'll go further? A football is a great example. Anybody ever tried to throw it? Actually, half the time when you try to spin, throw a nice spiral, it ends up tumbling anyway but it goes farther when it's spiraling, right? That's because it has rotational inertia. And it resists wanting to tip and tumble. What's something else? A bullet. Very good. They, they rifle a, a, a rifle, the, but the, the gun, the barrel, it'll cause the bullet to start spinning. Same idea as a football. How about one more? Airplane propeller, I don't think so. Not in that, not in that sense, but what'd you say? An arrow. An arrow. If it spun, it would be more stable. Uh, let's see, frisbees. Uh, that works. And this. If I shoot it without spinning, it goes a little far. This just doesn't stay on with my new rubber bands. But if I twist it, and pull back at the same time. Good throw. It'll give it some rotational inertia. And it'll be more stable. So I'll pull it back and twist it. That'll make it spin when it comes off. And that one hit the end, so that didn't work. Let me try again. I'll just try it without the doodah and hope it doesn't fall apart. And spin. There we go. All the way to the back. So it resists wanting to tip as much. Those forces have less of an effect on it. Anyway, I wanted to show that because I fixed it. Yay! Did anybody have? Oh, there it is. Woo! All right, we shot the uh, monkey in Cosmo last time. And I this. this is the uh, angle that projectiles follow. It's a parabola. What I wanted to, else I wanted to show with this is we shot the monkey the second time. We aimed up like this. 
See if I can keep it tight enough to stay that way. <clears throat> so since we can think of two-dimensional projectile motion as two separate one-dimensional motions, we can think of this in this fashion. You know, I'll get a pointer. If you turn the ground off, which way would it go? It would follow right along the PVC pipe, wouldn't it? Because inertia, keep going. One motion. And you can see it's equally spaced, constant velocity. Things that in motion want to stay in motion. Now turn gravity on. If it was right here, how far would it fall? Well, that's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six units of time later. How far would it fall just vertically if you dropped it from right here? One half AT squared. We could plug that in. After six seconds, let's say the unit of time is a second, so one half AT squared. One half of 10, the acceleration due to gravity is 5. What's 6 squared? 36. So what's 36 times 5? I don't know. Whatever that is, that's how many meters it would fall if you just dropped it from there and waited 6 seconds. Well, it takes 6 seconds to get over to there horizontally. So it's as if you like went straight and then turned gravity on and dropped it. Where does it end up if you have both turned on at the same time? The same spot. It goes If you wait a little longer, it gets further this way, but it's fallen further also. So each of these nuts represent where it would be at some given time interval later. Whether you're aiming horizontal or down, it'll still follow the parabola, and you can always predict where it would be. So even though it seems like a complicated problem, yeah, six seconds, where will it be? Well, with constant velocity, velocity is the change in over time, distance over time. So how far would it go? Constant velocity, six seconds. I don't know. Let's let's say v moving meters per second out in out in space. How far would it go in six seconds? Ten meters per second at four or four six seconds. It'll go 60 meters in a straight line. How far does it fall vertically? So this is like horizontally. Do vertically now. We did that and you guys just told me. The distance it goes is 1 half AT squared per second per second. For six seconds, anybody have a calculator? You know what that comes out to be? 36 times 5? 180. 180? Thank you. So vertically, it will have fallen 80 meters. So you put them, right? So if you aimed horizontally, it'll go over 60. Let's make that shorter. It'll go over 60 and down 180. You'll end up right there. If you shoot it up, you go 60 that way and down 180. They're just two independent motions. And you know how to calculate both now. You could, you could determine anything's going to end up at a given time later. You could toss a ball. All right, I'm going to shoot the ball. I'm going to throw it at 10 meters per second. Six seconds later, I know where it'll be. All right, that was my uh, follow-up summary from last week. It also stalled so more people could get here. Because there are just a, a few more clicker questions for this energy. Help us out. And let's see, that turned off. I'll turn it back on.
I have three questions. Now you've had more time to think about the energy stuff to help us uh, solidify it. So there's the info. Polling's open. These are a little, little more involved of thinking. See how well you use those reasoning skills from what you've, the knowledge you've acquired. Can you apply it? So you have a dog and a mouse down the road. They have the same kinetic energy. The key here is it's the same kinetic energy. You know what kinetic energy is now. So how does that relate to their speed? Is one moving faster than the other if they have the same kinetic energy? It's a dog and a mouse. I personally like this question. <laughs> People logged in okay? Ten? Nine? What's that? Oh, you're working it out? That's fine. That's why I ask and start counting. I'll give a few more seconds here. Yeah, talk to your neighbor. That's, that's, I, I encourage that. You made it. How do you find kinetic energy? One half times the mass times the velocity squared. Unless you weren't any, none of you were thinking of that. Let, let's see. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Your votes are in. Eighty percent B, the mouse. Once, the, once my computer re responds, I'll check. <laughs> well, I already know the right answer. There, oh, there it is. So what I didn't expect today is a dog and a mouse have different masses. So if the dog, which has more mass, has the same kinetic energy as the mouse that has less mass, its velocity must be less. Its velocity squared is less, so its velocity is less also. The bigger object must be moving more slowly if they have the same energy of motion, kinetic energy. That's fun, too, uh, if you think of uh, temperature. Temperature is actually like a... It's a it's a measurement of the average kinetic energy that the molecules have. So the air in the room, you can think of all the gas molecules moving around. Some are moving fast, some are moving slow. Some have a lot of kinetic energy, some have little. On average, they have a certain amount of kinetic energy. And temperature, 20 degrees Celsius, is a measure of that, if you didn't know. But it's on average. Well, our air is made up of different sized particles. You have big oxygen molecules and tiny hydrogen molecules. On average, who's moving faster, the hydrogen or the oxygen? It's the dog and the mouse. Who, who in, in here, if they have, on average, the same kinetic energy? Who's moving faster? The smaller ones. So yeah, hydrogen, on average, is moving around faster than the oxygens. 
if they're at the same temperature, thus have a, the same average kinetic energy. That's interesting too. Does that make sense? I'm listening. If the dog and the mouse were the exact same mass, then yeah. Since I didn't tell you the masses, you could say can't say, but I've never seen a dog less mass than a mouse. So, <laughs> but technically, yes. If you want to fight that and email me, I'll give you your points. <laughs> All right, here's a simple machine problem. So here you have a pulley, it just redirects the force. On one side, you can lift with, you pull the rope down with 20 newtons of force. Well, that has an effect over here on the other side of lifting something up with 80 newtons of force. So you've multiplied the force, mechanical advantage. That's helping you. That's what a simple machine can do. Well, if you, have to, if you pull the rope down one meter, how far does it move on the other side? That's what it's asking. So you got a force and, and uh, a distance on one side. There's a force and a distance on the other side. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. There's a lot less of you vote. There we go. Most of you think C, and you're right. Uh, we got one more. So if you pull with 20 newtons on one side, a certain distance. The other side, you get 80 newtons out, right? So there's the forces. A big force and a little force. The key here is that energy is conserved. That's the point of chapter 7. Simple machines cannot magically create energy out of nothing. So the energy is the same. So the amount of work done on each side has to be the same. But that doesn't mean the forces and distances have to be. Uh, for every one meter of the rope, she pulls down. So over here at 20, moved at one meter. Well, who's going to move it further? Which side? Well, you got a big F here. So if you had a big D, that couldn't equal. Yeah, so that's the big This will be the little So it's going to be something less than a meter, just conceptually. How much less? Well, what's the difference in forces? A factor of four. 20 compared to 80, it's a factor of four. So she, she has to move the rope four times as much. If she moves it a meter, that means it only moves a quarter, 25 centimeters which is 0.25 or a quarter of a meter. That makes sense. To keep energy conserved. Reality, she'll probably have to move it even further to overcome some friction and whatnot, because some of that energy will be converted to heat. Work done by friction. But All right, one more. Here, we end with an efficiency. 
See if you understand that. You can look in your notes, but let's remind the whole class. What's efficiency? Energy out divided by energy in. It's the percentage you get out versus what you put in. Does that help anybody? So we'll see how efficient this card jack is. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. A little wall overwhelming majority of thirty percent. And you are correct. So how much did we put in? The car jack did. A thousand joules. How much energy did we get out of that? Yeah, it only changed, it raised it up, gave it potential energy. That's energy of 300 joules. So yeah, that's 30 percent, 0 0.30. So that jack is only 30 percent efficient. 70 percent of that energy was quote unquote wasted didn't go to where we wanted it to go. But at least we could do it. Uh, the jack is a simple machine. Was this one a hydraulic or a screw jack? Either way, I don't know. But it, it amplified the force. You can't lift the car by yourself. But the jack can. So the jack will have to move further than the car gets lifted to keep energy conserved. But we don't get all of it out. Questions? OK, you can put your quick clickers away. And I'm going to do some demonstrations. So I have a cart here that rolls along the track. and a spring-loaded launcher. So I compress the spring, and when I activate it, there's a little sensor on this side. By blocking it, watch what happens to the ball. It shoots straight up out of the cart. So there's a vertical velocity that it gives it. What I'm going to do is when the car is moving horizontally, it's going to pass here. When it passes there, it triggers it, and it will shoot it straight up. So question, will the ball land in the cart? Will it land back here, here, or maybe even in front of it? What do you think? In the cart? But this shoots straight up. When it's over here, it releases it. How would the ball get over to here? It would have to have a horizontal velocity, but the spring only gives it a vertical velocity. If you're throwing a ball while you're driving, what, what happens? If you're driving along and you toss the ball up, where does the ball go? It stays with you. You don't see it magically go like this, do you? <laughs> that would be weird. Why does it stay with you? I think the majority of you are getting it. Let's find out. Load the spring, and here we go. It does stay with it. 
the ball, when it's moving with the cart, what's the ball's velocity? Same as the cart. It, it has a horizontal velocity when it gets to here. What does the spring add? A vertical velocity. All right. So if you're the ball and you feel a force that way, the cart moving you that way, and you feel the spring pushing you that way, point. You guys know which way will you go. You're going to add the components up vectorially. Everybody point. See if you get it. That's right. It's going to go up and over. And so a nice parabola. And if its horizontal velocity is exactly the same as the cart, the cart travels j far in a certain amount of time. Horizontally, the ball has to travel the same distance. It went up and back down in the interim, but horizontally it had the same, so it covers the same horizontal distance. Now, just to make it more interesting, will it still make it? Yeah, it depends on how fast I go. So I have to go faster, don't I? All right, wish me luck. Yay! <laughs> If you go too slowly, you'll know right where the cart was at that moment. The cart was right there. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> Woo! Barely. <laughs> so, I'm not going to give you the answer. Actually, we just have. But there's a homework question about this. And so that a lot of people get confused with it. This is directly related. It's an airplane dropping a package. Think about this when you're trying to answer that question. All righty, let's do this one. This is my projectile launcher. It's spring-loaded, so I can put a, a, a ball in here. Compress the spring. I'm going to compress it more. I can set the angle it shoots at. Let's put it at 45 degrees. There we go. That means 45 degrees means you're, it's a square because we're right in the middle. So it, it's giving the same component of velocity horizontally as it is vertically. So these are equal in magnitude. What will the ball do? It's going to go that way. But then gravity acts on it, right? It slows down and speeds back up in the downward direction. What does its horizontal velocity do? Is there any force acting on it horizontally? No. So it should stay, keep the same horizontal velocity. There is a little bit of air resistance, but it's negligible. Mostly. <laughs> you know, it is real life. Well, let's see where it lands. Oh, further than, I guess. What was it, about there-ish? Yeah. Let's do it again. So that's 45 degrees. And relaunch. See if I make it. Yay! Now I'm going to change, excuse me, change the angle to 60 degrees. What will happen? Higher but shorter, I hear. Can, you, can we uh, look at the uh, vectors? 45 was like this. How should I adjust? Say that again. This? Let's see. If I do that, yeah, the result is that way. So I, I can agree with that. We, we could represent it like this. I like that. I'm going to add, though, let's, let's look at the horizontal and, and vertical components, because this shifts it, like our axes. So what are, what are the horizontal and vertical components? of these. 
With 45, they were looked like this. Yes? This one is less, and this one more. Does that make sense, too? That would still get it at the same angle. But that way we can focus on the horizontal and vertical components. So, it's, yeah, it's going to go higher because this is bigger. And it won't go quite as far because this is less. Or will it? If this is bigger, does it spend more time in the air than 45? I guess maybe I could be like this that way. 45 versus 60. It'll spend more time in the air. So maybe it's not going as fast horizontally, but it has more time in the air to get there. What do you think? But that doesn't change the horizontal. Doesn't change the horizontal. It might go higher, but this is still less. So horizontally, it shouldn't go as far. Let, let's check. So here's 60 degrees. That's still where the 45 landed. Right, it worked. Physics is true. So it landed here. Let's do that one. Let's see. Was that going to make it? A little further? Because it's more fun when it lands in the thingy. <laughs> All right, 60 again. I mean, it still didn't go far. All right, it landed here, so. <laughs> now, I'm going to change it to 30 degrees. What will happen? What will change? Think about the two vectors components, horizontal and vertical. I'll go ahead and load it. All right. So now, you know, 45, 60. Now what do we have? 30. Will it go further? Let's see. Still landed in it. It went about the same distance. Do it one more time, unless it was a fluke or something. Lands in the bucket. So it doesn't go much further. How come? It doesn't have as much air time. Remember, if this is less, yeah, it's moving faster, but it doesn't spend as much time in the air. There's a thing that if the angles are uh, complementary, meaning they add up to 90 degrees, 60 plus 30 is 90. So 60 and 30 go the same distance. The, we call it the range, the horizontal distance. 60 and 30 go the same. And even though 60 and 30 both went less than 45, right? We saw that. But 60 and 30 went the same. Now this works. It spends more time in the air. It's not going as fast horizontally, but it's got more time to get further because it spends more time in the air. Where 30, it's going faster, but it doesn't have as much air time. So the, in, the result is that they, they cover the same distance, ideally. Another pair would be uh, 75 degrees and... 15, because they add up to 90. Now, they'll go a different distance than 30 and 60, but 75 and 15 will go the same distance. Now, you guys are good scientists, and these did not go exactly the same distance. Who went a little further? 30. Now, that's real life. Why? The 30 went farther than the 60. Ideally, they're supposed to go exactly the same. Beautiful. Who spends more time in the air? The 60. So 
there is a little air resistance, so it's not completely negligible. It shows up here. The 60 got hindered more than the 30 because it spent more time in the air. So it didn't go quite as far as the 30. And you could see that. Let's really exaggerate it. Here's a styrofoam ball. You know air resistance is going to play a factor on it, right? I'll even leave it at 30. All right. You saw how far it went with a uh, solid ball. Well, this one's still solid. You know what I mean. Now the air resistance is conspicuous, very noticeable. Questions? That's a factor too. Yeah, this is lighter. Just like uh, a feather versus a book. They both encounter air resistance, but it's, it's negligible with something that's heavier. You know, you reach different terminal velocities in that sense. To help you visualize some of this, we have some simulations that I'd like to show you. All right, so here's the ball. We have gravity turned on. It's going to do a stroboscope, show you uh, the position of the ball at equal units of time. Equal units of time as it falls. How do you expect the spacing of the, of the, of the ball to be? See how it covers more and more distance down here where it's going faster? Up here it doesn't cover as much distance because it's accelerating. We've done many examples like that. If I turn gravity off and turn the horizontal velocity on, how do you expect the spacing to be? It's a constant velocity, so it's equally spaced. Just like the strings, they're equally spaced horizontally. So do them both at the same time. Let's give it a horizontal velocity. Whoops and turn gravity on, what will it do? It looked like my model, it'll be a parabola. Bingo. Look at this closely. See, horizontally, the spacing is the same. You can look at the grid. But vertically, it gets, covers more and more distance. That's two-dimensional projectile motion. Now we shot one where we did it at the same time. We'll, hit, we'll knock this one off. So basically, one gets shot horizontally. At the, other, at the same time, one drops straight. Who hits the ground first? So the red one has an additional horizontal velocity. So sure, it, it goes further out, away from the table. But they still fall exactly the same. Even if I shoot it faster. What will be the difference? It'll go further, but who will hit the ground first? Right, they still fall exactly the same. So it doesn't matter if you shoot that bullet really fast, horizontally. What if you shot the bullet up? And time. Who's Because this one has to back down to that initial height, and then fall from there. So yeah, if you shoot it up or down, that'll change who hits first. But if you shoot horizontally like this, um, I'll come back to this. But here's a way you can do it at home. You don't need a big I-beam and Cosmo Cougar and all that, the fancy stuff. Here you go, two pennies, an index card, and a pen or your finger. I just like a pen better. So I'm going to put it on here. This acts as a pivot. I'm going to put one penny here, one penny here. This one's hanging off the table. This one's not. What I'm going to do is flick it on this end. What's it going to do to this penny? Yeah, it's going to shoot it out horizontally. What's it going to do to this penny? Yeah, it, it, the, the card, if I flick it over here, the card over here goes towards me. It's going to get pulled out from underneath the penny. 
the, it, the penny's inertia will keep it in place, and it'll just fall. So here's a nice inexpensive way of doing this simultaneous drop. Again, we'll listen when it hits the floor. Are you ready? Same time. What if, review of unit one, let's do the same exact thing with a quarter and a dime. These have different masses, so that could affect things. The force on them is different. Who do you expect to hit the ground first now? Same, most of it. Okay, here we go. Yep, they hit at the same time. Because I hope you know by now, all things fall vertically at the same acceleration. So yes, they still hit vertically at the same time. So here, we shoot things. Here's the 45 degrees. This is what I tried to do with my arms. You got the uh, vertical component and the horizontal component. See how they're equal? So the actual velocity, in this case, 65 meters per second, is that way, up and to the right. That's the muzzle velocity, if you will. So you hit play. It goes up and back down. Now watch those components again. Watch the horizontal component. What do you notice? It doesn't change. It shouldn't. Things in motion want to stay in motion. So horizontally, it just stays at a constant velocity unless some force acts upon it. Obviously, there's no air resistance here. Now, just for completeness, watch the vertical component. Which, which direction is the acceleration? It's vertical, and more specifically, down. Gravity acts down, so it's being accelerated down the whole time. At what rate? 10 meters per second every second. So you see the velocity slows down, goes to zero at the top, and then turns around and speeds up vertically downward in the negative direction. So it's always being accelerated down, and that one does change. So if we shoot it at uh, 60, de well, 60 degrees, See how the components change? It's higher up here than it is there. So you can see it, it goes higher, but that horizontal component still isn't changing. And let's see where it lands. About 375 meters there, in between 350 and 400. So we'll call that 375. Let's change it to 30 degrees. You see how the components adjust? Hit play, doesn't go as high, but it's going faster horizontally, so it can still get over there to 375 degrees. This is an animation. They're doing the laws of physics. You know where they're going to land. We did that. So that's how these are doing it. I tried to show you in real life here. So let, let's shoot 60 degrees. Two Lands over there. Change it to 30. Two. Same spot. 75. Doesn't go as far as 60 and 30, but it goes a lot higher. 15. It hardly gets off the ground, but, but it's, it's got a lot of horizontal velocity, so it still makes it as far as 75. And then one more animation. Do you have any questions so far? Are you getting that this two-dimensional? It's just two separate one-dimensional motion problems. If you can keep that straight, you're ahead of most of the, uh, the world's population. <laughs> all right, here's a cannon at the top. This is all I'm going to say about orbits. Because an orbit is really just projectile motion. You fire at one kilometer a second here, horizontally off the top of a high mountain. And what's it do? It's attracted down to the earth. There's a parabolic motion. It goes yay far and hits the ground. What happens if you shoot it faster? It goes further. 
Right. Faster still? Let's go four kilometers a second. Fire. Phew, it just goes further. What happens if I keep going fast? Turn faster. Goes farther and farther. Oh. Let's try seven. What's happening? Why did it go further? Well, you're shooting it faster, but there's something else happening. When you're going this fast, kilometers a second, what's the ground doing? Yeah, it's curving. It's like going out from underneath you also, isn't it? You know, here we say, yeah, Earth is flat, but we know better. So when you're shooting at these velocities, it's trying to fall, but if the ground is falling out from underneath you also, you never hit the ground. At some point, let's go even faster. Eight kilometers a second. Reload, fire. It just went into orbit. That's what an orbit is. It's nothing more than constantly free falling. It's always falling. It's just that the Earth curves out underneath it at the same rate, so it never hits the ground. That's what our satellites are doing. That's what the space shuttle astronauts. Yeah, if there's a, a force that acts on them to slow them down, then they go slow enough that, yeah, they'll crash into the Earth. What happens if you go even faster? Let's go nine. It goes further out. But there's still gravitational attraction between the two, so it does come back. It's still falling. It's just like you aimed it a bit, you know? You shot it up more than you did horizontally because the Earth curves. So it's still in orbit. If you go, keep going faster and faster, at some point, there's a speed where you can escape the pull of gravity. In other words, you give the uh, object more kinetic energy than the Earth trying to do work on it. And it can actually escape, and it, and it leaves orbit. But again, an orbit is nothing more than projectile motion where you're going fast enough that it's constantly falling. So last comment. Astronauts, they feel weightless, but there's still gravity out there. On the space shuttle or the space station, there's still actually a whole lot of gravity. It's not, like, it's not zero. They're just constantly in free fall going around in their orbit. And what do you feel like when, you, when you're falling? Ah, you feel weightless, don't you? It's when the ball's in the air. Ah. It has no weight, in a sense, when it's falling. And that's what astronauts are doing. They're just constantly falling as they go around. All right, that was fun. You guys have a great day.